This is Outside of New York, in-depth discussions with members of the art world who live and work outside of New York. And here's your host, Craig Gould. Bruce and Julie Webb have owned and operated the Webb Gallery in Waxahachie, Texas since 1987. The art gallery is a destination for collectors worldwide who share the Webb's fondness of art in its rawest and most authentic form. Bruce funneled the eccentricities of his family's history and a childhood combing through flea markets to develop a love for the odd, handmade, and unique. He and Julie have worked over the last 30 years to curate an aesthetic that recognizes contemporary folk art that, in Bruce's words, feels like it's from another planet. The couple's world-class collection of art from fraternal organizations, like the Masons and Oddfellows, led to Bruce co-authoring a fully illustrated book on the subject in 2016, titled As Above, So Below, Art of the American Fraternal Society from 1850 to 1930. The webs are a household name in the world of outsider art and are participants each year in New York's Outsider Art Fair. I recently sat down with Bruce and Julie at their gallery where we discussed flea markets, punk rock, Freemasonry, hobos, folk art, the uniqueness of Waxahachie, their friendship with David Byrne, and spending half the year on the road finding treasures. I meet so many interesting people, I guess, involved being involved in anything, but especially if you set out to represent self-taught artists you know especially older people have so many great stories that kind of you get a little glimpses of that when you visit them oh yeah yeah so where you know what what where's your guys story start i mean you guys you you guys are you want to start or you want me to start (laughs) you you guys aren't you know we're in waxahachie but you guys uh, you guys aren't Oddly enough, I am from Waxahachie. Oh, I was I born was, here. I was born in yeah. Tenery, WC Tenery. Me too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. August, you know. uh, ni- August seventh, nineteen sixty-six. Oh wow! Uh, so you, you got four years on me. I was yeah. uh, June, yeah. June of seventy, and so uh, you know, I think uh, it looks like it's in mothballs as I was driving by. It is now. Right. Yeah, they moved to the new one, and. I don't know what's going to happen with the old one. I guess maybe it'll become a senior citizen center or something at best, or sure. maybe they'll they'll uh, turn it into some kind of residential thing. Or sure. So something. that's definitely how we started here, because Bruce really is from here, right. even though he didn't grow up here. Yeah, I grew up in Richardson, and my grandparents moved to Waxahachie in 1952. Wow. From Polgot, South India. Wow. Uh, they were uh, part of the, the Pentecostal evangelical movement, the Assembly of God, uh-huh. and were both from, from small towns in Kansas, farming communities, Osborne, Kansas, my granddad and my grandmother's from McCracken, Kansas. And somehow they became interested in, in this, this uh, movement that, that was a rural kind of thing based in in uh, agrarian kind of areas and somehow they got the calling as they always right. said to go into the mission field in India right and so my grandmother was always a reader and so she would go to bookstores and buy all the books she could find about India before she before they left to uh, you know, uh, to go to India and I think they spent some amount of time, traveling around pastoring churches in kind of remote areas. I know the Kentucky Mountains was one story that uh, my, my grandmother would often talk about where they were uh, preaching in a small uh, church or, or, or building, or maybe it was a house, and uh, 
suddenly a bullet comes through the wall. I think they were in like moonshine country <laughs> and like you know these uh, um, evangelicals preaching um, you know some kind of a, a you know abstention from alcohol campaign. It was it was not going to go over well. Oh so, wow. Uh, the bullet went through the wall and landed just inches from her head. And so she kind of took that as a sign that, you know, she was spared for a reason. Right. And so I'm not sure exactly how they, they wound up going to India. It could be that's just where people were needed. Yeah. Uh, and so in the 1930s, they shipped out from New York and sailed uh, during wartime to, to India and uh, kind of went by way of the Suez Canal, and, mm-hmm. and we've kind of been able to read some of my grandmother's diaries and through old photographs, see that it was a really interesting trip. Oh, and, I uh, I've, uh, I mean, in, that day, in those days, it, it, it yeah. would have taken probably a month oh, yeah, to get the there travel, easily, the right? Ship Abs- travel. Absolutely, yeah. It was a long, long voyage, and uh, my grandparents were given... Uh, the area of South India, the hill stations of Kerala, which is um, sort of the, the Chile of, of the Indian subcontinent. It runs along the, mm-hmm. the western edge, and at it, it, one side it's, it's beaches and palm mm-hmm. trees, and then it goes up to lush mountains right. uh, uh, that are, you know, the, the Ghats, the western Ghats. And then your mother was born there. And, uh, so my grandparents were there for a few years, and my mother was born uh, in, in Paul Gott. Right. And my grandparents had also lived in, in Cochin, or back, back then, and now it's called Kochi. Uh, and in 2000, Julie and I got a chance to go to India and spend about three weeks traveling around. And our favorite was the south. Uh, right. And that, that part of, of South India, like it, it's an interesting area, Vasco da Gama, came there it was a major connection to the spice uh, mm-hmm. trade in Europe and right. those trade winds carried the spices the black pepper of the Malabar coast and you know all the wonderful spices to to Europe and so there's kind of a Portuguese influence even in the architecture sure. of, of Kochi mm-hmm. and uh, the backwaters it almost reminds you of like the Bayou culture of Louisiana and Right. The architecture there, some of it kind of has an African kind of a, a look, not unlike mm-hmm. what we later encountered with Prophet Royal Robertson with this sort of uh, uh, Robert Ferris Thompson would be talking about the four movements of the sun and diamond patterns right. and these kind of lightning bolt designs that you'd sure. see even in South India. So, yeah. um, my, you know, my grandparents came back in 1952 uh, my mother was 16 years old, and I came to Waxahachie, where right. uh, she had been raised at the Cody Connell International School. Okay. Uh, while my grandparents were out in a jeep traveling to remote kind of villages, uh, she was kind of raised under an English boarding school system. Right. And it was really a culture shock being in Waxahachie in 1952, <laughs> where Jim Crow laws were in right. effect and water fountains were separated and things were segregated and right. so um, she had grown up playing with Indian children in caves and you know in the in the jungle and stuff and so you know Waxahachie yeah. uh, devoid of all, <laughs> all that stuff must have really been a difficult transition for her and so um so through all what, of that, what was, what was the attraction back in Waxahachie? Was it the Southwestern Assembly were, of God's yeah, University? Yeah so or? as this new founded uh, evangelical movement the Assembly of God uh, started getting uh, some momentum. Uh, Trinity University had been in Waxahachie right. up until the 1920s, and then it moved to San Antonio. And the university grounds were purchased by uh, the Southwestern Assembly of God Church, which already had a college in Springfield, Missouri. Right. Uh, but they, uh, I think, put two different small colleges together, Central Bible College mm-hmm. and South, and, and it became Southwestern right. Bible College here. And so they were offered positions teaching, and I think they felt like my mom being being 16, you know, they wanted to come back right mm-hmm. here so she could, you know, go on to school and maybe go to college. And so she wound up going to school there uh, and at, at the university, uh, which kind of also had high school classes back in the 50s. 
And one of my grandmother's students who my mom remembered seeing was Jerry Lee Lewis. Who wow. would, uh, he went to Bible college here, and he kind of grew up I in that, that Pentecostal movement in okay. Faraday, Louisiana. Sure. And uh, so he, he was in, in Bible school in sure. 1952 and part of 1953, and he started playing the Big D Jamboree. Right. And somehow it didn't really fit in with the the model of right. a Bible student. You well, know, so. you know, and, and it's always I'm so fascinated that Jerry Lee Lewis's cousins were Mickey Gilly and uh, Jimmy Swagger. Jimmy Swagger, yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. And, and if you like, hear old Mickey Gilly, he and Jerry Lee have that same kind of barrel oh, house kind of sound. Going. And you know, and and Jimmy Swagger would would do the same thing in his you know his he would form. he would swing and play, or sing and play the piano and, yeah. and you know, that whole yeah. and just them going off and doing their own, you know, kind of taking on their corners of the world and all being from the same. They all three right. had that And you realize that rock and roll and that unbridled Pentecostal energy, it's not that different. You right. Know, change a few names here and there. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's all right. that spiritual charismatic flair. Right. The flair. True. Sure. True. And sure. I, I uh, so I grew up um, an only child. My mom's an only child, and my grandmother was a big book collector. And so, when when growing up in Richardson, we would come and visit my grandparents here in Waxahachie. Mm-hmm. My grandmother had this book room with a big credenza with paper and art supplies down below, and then her collection of antique books. And so, I I would you know pour over the books and books on Hinduism and Islam and. You know, old books that she bought in India right. from the 1800s, uh, Indian folklore and, and uh, books about kind of obscure religions. And so I, you know, kind of ate all this stuff up. And then when my grandmother passed away in 1987, um, we inherited the house and the books. Mm-hmm. And, and I, it's kind of, I've become a book collector Right. Uh, from that point, and especially like old obscure occult books, and I continue to collect old books about India and, in, sure. and Hinduism. I think and it only enhanced theosophy. our collecting of books and such. And plus, my grandparents collected a lot of wood carvings and idols and things made out of paper mache that they right. that they bought. And that area of of Kerala is known for wood right. carvers and all the temples there you know from florida up it's all like elaborate carvings so, so is it safe to say that your grandparents house was a a, a house of oddities that you would like yes. explore yes and- yeah yeah everything from like carved coconuts that i've continued to collect and wood carvings and things that were fragile things that were mysterious that my grandmother kept wrapped up in in bread uh, bags that she didn't want me to see, copulating, you know, deities <laughs> and things like that. And, right. uh, you know, so much of that whole um, early, early uh, religion of, of Hinduism mm-hmm. is about the, you know, basic form of the yoni and, you know, the, the lingam is in every temple. And when, right. you, when you go to India, it's like, oh, every, there's, there's the nandi and it's looking at the lingam and then there's the yoni, and they all have this kind of set format. Right. That when you go to those temples, it, it um, sort of replicates everything throughout the whole country. And there's a couple of books that had a big influence on me. Um, Louis Jocelot, he was a French, uh, so, some kind of a, a administrator or something. He was in India. The book's called The Bible in India. Okay. And his premise is that all of these stories in Hinduism have um, something that's parallel in every world religion. There's a crucifixion of Krishna. Mm -hmm. Um, Buddha is tied to a tree, and Christ is crucified. So you realize that these stories are the same, but, you know, they they like change some of the names and and things all around the world. And so to me, I guess, you know, I kind of became a theosophist Mm-hmm. Not really an evangelical Christian as a result of my grandmother's right. collection of books. <laughs> right. And in a way, I guess that's how we became folk art collectors and interested in, in kind of self-taught art and, sure. and kind of, in a way, self-taught folklorists in, in preserving things that we recognize as being, you know, this thread of, of uh, kind of wisdom that um, just kind of put together dots. You're like, oh, yeah, this is so similar to this over here. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I teach art history in addition to, you know, painting and things at high school. 
And, you know, it's something that, you know, you can't help but you know, bring up over.